Hi everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton, and welcome back to our discussion of Gavin Ortland's videos on the creation and veneration of icons in the early church. Today, Michael completes his review of the Antonicene evidence by looking at more passages from Origen, Tertullian, and St. Methodius. If you're interested in pursuing this subject further, consider following Michael on Substack, either as a free or a paid subscriber, where he continues to develop these themes in written form. I also post six days a week on Substack, two to five page reflections on scripture, three are for free, and three are for paid subscribers, as well as patrons at $5 per month. Also at tier two of my Patreon, you get that, and you get exclusive content, including weekly book reviews around 40 minutes to an hour long. And at tier three, you get all of that exclusive content, plus monthly one-on-one -on -one calls of 60 minutes each on anything you'd like to talk about, as long as I have something to say that I believe will be useful or edifying. And that continues as long as you remain a patron at that tier. Also in the description box and pinned comment, you can find links to my courses, my 17-hour course answering Protestantism from the Bible, six and a half hour course answering Calvinism from the Bible, and my expanding set of lectures answering Judaism's rejection of Jesus presently at 15 hours, but ultimately will end up being something between 20 and 25 hours. With all of that said, we appreciate your time and we hope that you enjoy today's presentation. Moving on to origin. The passage that I, I previously noted is one that's little known uh, and referenced in origin that describes various forms of veneration that are done in church, bowing one's head to priests, exhibiting courtesy, honoring the servants of God, bringing something for the decoration of the altar or church. Origen is noting here <clears throat> the problem of merely external piety, which uh, doesn't actually ultimately result in any inward transformation, but he's not, of course, uh, chastising people for exhibiting these forms of veneration in church. <clears throat> He's referring to a pious practice of decorating altars in churches, and he compares coarse Christians who show only outward piety by venerating things to the Gibeonites from the Old Testament. And as noted previously, the altar in church here must be literal. It can't be a metaphor for the inner altar of the soul. Uh, I know that there are passages where Origen does speak of altars in these terms, but this makes it clear that you can't go from passages in which Origen describes uh, a kind of spiritualized understanding of the altar as kind of like the altar of the heart. You can't go from that to the conclusion that he does not believe in the existence of uh, physical altars. This altar is an image of the heavenly altar of God or of God's throne composed of the cherubim. And the church would then be, of course, an image of the heavenly assembly, the heavenly courtroom gathered around God's throne. Um, Origen also notes his belief that Christian altars are holy. He talks about how the altars uh, of Christians are no longer sprinkled with the blood of oxen, but consecrated by the precious blood of Christ. And this implies they are not just images, but in fact, holy images. You see also in Origen an acceptance of the type prototype principle. And this text is itself very interesting, and uh, the language in it um, <clears throat> suggests perhaps that he sees scriptural grounding for the type prototype principle in relation to images of the emperor. So he says, and so that you may be more persuaded that if you revile your neighbor, you have reviled Christ, I will also present this from the holy letters. If anyone abuses the wooden or waxen image of an emperor, he is condemned as if he had abused the emperor since he commits an abuse against the image. And you, if you abuse or revile someone who has already restored the in the image of the creator, it is his image that you have abused and reviled. So this shows a clear um, acceptance already this early on in the church of the type prototype principle that the honor or dishonor given to an image passes to the prototype. Now, a question could be raised, and I think implicitly was raised by Dr. Dr. Orland about whether this really is veneration. Um, and what I would suggest is that it's presented clearly as last in a series of actions of veneration within the church, bowing your head to the priests, exhibiting courtesy, honoring the servants of God. Dr. Orland um, suggested that these uh, written evidences that I presented uh, from St. Ignatius, Clement, Origen, Tertullian, and St. Methodius, that they can all be reduced to kind of decorative, didactive, or commemorative uses of images. 
And I think it's possible that he had in mind that with Origen, what we have here is a placing of images on the altar uh, as a way of decorating. However, uh, regardless of exactly what kind of decorating process Origen is talking about, exactly what materials he's using, whether that involves the placement of images or the placement of flowers or candles or um, something else. Um, the point of this quote, though, is that honor is being directed to the image by means of the decoration. Um, and this is not this is not mere decoration. Uh, it is an act of honor. We noted, uh, Seraphim and I previously noted that in the Gospels, uh, the practice of decorating the tombs of the prophets is identified by Christ as a way the Pharisees hypocritically uh, try to show honor to the prophets. And so the practice of, of decorating an image is a way of directing honor to that image. It manifests the honorable status of the image which is decorated. So in summary, what is being decorated here is the altar, which is an image of the heavenly altar or of God's throne. And therefore, honor is being given to the altar as image, which passes to the prototype, the heavenly altar or God's throne. Now, regarding Tertullian, <clears throat> to review, uh, I noted two passages in his On Modesty, in which he describes Christian use of uh, cups bearing the image of the good shepherd. In the first uh, of these two passages, he talks about the cups, um, their paintings, coming forward to show a certain uh, meaning for one of the parables of Christ. In the second passage, he talks about the shepherd of Hermas and uh, notes basically that it was, it's not considered to be part of the scriptures. And he accuses the person that he's writing to of basically using the shepherd of Hermas as a justification for allowing people who have committed adultery to take communion, even if, you know, committed adultery, even if they have repented. Tertullian is a <clears throat> rigorist about these matters and does not believe that people who have done that can receive absolution and partake again. Now, I noted last time that there are such things as uh, cultic or ritual cups in the Greco-Roman context. And here I'd like to present some examples of this. Um, the one in the upper left-hand corner is the Lycurgus cup that I noted previously that portrays Dionysius and is basically believed to have been uh, used for uh, Bacchic rituals, Dionysian rituals. In the bottom left corner, you have a consecrated silver cup um, <clears throat> that represents Mercury or, or Hermes from first or second century France. And on the right-hand side, you have a very common vessel in the Greek context, the symposium cup. Symposium cups could take different forms, some of them more, some of them less um, uh, kind of scary and bizarre. But one of the things to note about them is that for some of the more extreme kinds of symposium cups, there's a very participatory aspect to the images on them. Um, as someone would be drinking wine out of this kind of a bowl, the more deeply someone would drink, the more the kind of eye shapes on the front of the bowl would cover the person's face. Um, this would basically be part of what would induce um, people to have certain kinds of experiences that they believed were from the gods. And so there's this kind of participatory aspect to the art. Um, there's also images on the insides of these bowls, which as you drink further and further down, the images get more and more bizarre. There's this idea that you're kind of going more and more deeply into, you're participating more and more deeply in Dionysius, who's often pictured on these. And it's, of course, the god of wine. So there's this idea that um, such cups are inherently participatory, that they are used in uh, festivities that commemorate the gods, and that the images of the gods that are on them direct worship to the one who is imaged. So here I'll note um, uh, that this idea is uh, in James Hadley's article, Early Christian Perceptions of Sacred Spaces. He says that ritual cups in late antique ritual dining were distinguished from daily items by design and decoration. The cups were often identified by images of the deity in whose worship they were utilized. Identifiable cult objects like the cup with the image of the pastor bonus, the good shepherd, referenced to by Tertullian, illustrate the Christians also exhibited a type of religious experience that separated out and reserved particular objects as more appropriate for ritual acts. 
Christian communities of the time thought to distinguish between daily and religiously meaningful objects, thereby exhibiting belief in the material mediation of religious experience. So there is, again, this participatory and unitive aspect of this worship. There's a sharing in the life of the depicted divine being, and there's a honoring that divine being by means of the use of this ritual cup. So at the outset, it's important when we turn to Tertullian to note that the paintings of the Good Shepherd on the Cups are not objected to by him, and uh, instead he thinks they can mystagogically reveal the true meaning of the Eucharist, that they can basically correct misunderstandings of the sacrament that they are to be used in. There's a theological authority to the images, too. He's talking to clergy he believes are heretical for teaching that people who have committed grievous sins can be absolved and again receive the Eucharist. Hence his language of whether a Christian or heathen sinner be the object it aims at in the matter of restoration. The image on the cup is put forward as having authority to show the true meaning of the, par um, of the parable of the lost sheep. This explains Tertullian intense invective against the early Christian text, The Shepherd of Hermas. Some early Christians were making use of The Shepherd of Hermas and treating it as though it were part of the Christian scriptures. The text clearly teaches that a second repentance and absolution is possible, which Tertullian, as an early rigorist Christian, regards as permissive to the point of essentially allowing adultery and idolatry. The Shepherd of Hermas is an apocalyptic text which portrays Hermas, a Roman Christian, receiving revelations from an angel, the angel of repentance, appearing in the form of a shepherd. Uh, so, hence Tertullian says, if the scriptures of the shepherd, which is the only one which favors adulterers, it's self-adulterous and hence the patroness of its comrades, from which in other respects too you derive initiation. So all this language shows that what's in view for him and what's the object of criticism is the Shepherd of Hermas text and the character of the in the Shepherd of Hermas, this angel of repentance. All the language in this passage demonstrates that the cup in question follows the typical Greco-Roman role of cultic drinking cups. Tertullian speaks of deriving initiation, the shepherd who will play the patron, the one whom you depict upon your chalice, the prostitutor of the Christian sacrament. He speaks about sipping nothing more readily than the flavor of the you of your second repentance. And then Tertullian offers his own kind of counter to this, that he imbibes or receives or drinks the scriptures of that shepherd who cannot be broken. <clears throat> All of this shows that worship and mystical initiation uniting to the depicted deity are in view. There's other evidence also of early ritual cups in Christianity. Uh, again, from uh, James Hadley's article, Early Christian Perceptions of Sacred Space, about a century after Tertullian's On Modesty, uh, there's a document from Northern Africa, which I will not try to pronounce, which records the confiscation of numerous liturgical objects at Numidia, North Africa, during the Diocletian persecution. Two golden cups, six silver cups, six silver, uh, I believe that's supposed to be jugs, a silver casket, seven silver lamps, and 11 bronze lamps with chains. So there is this idea then of holy objects uh, that early Christians were setting apart for ritual use for the sacraments and specifically of uh, ritual cups uh, made of honorable materials such as gold or silver. Note again this connection between the, the kind of composition of um, the cup and the way that it would likely then be treated, the fact that these would be for ritual use. Now, all of this would uh, seems to make sense, but why then does, Tertu does Tertullian say that uh, the shepherd of Hermas is worthily both the idol of drunkenness and the brise, as in a, a fly, uh, that's actually a reference to flies, like the insect, of adultery. One could take this wording as basically uh, being kind of a ute, uh, as being kind of a point where Tertullian is indicating that he views these uh, good shepherd images as idolatrous. However, the problem does not seem to be with the image of the good shepherd, which Tertullian thinks can correct a misunderstanding of the parable of the lost sheep, and therefore a misunderstanding of the sacrament itself. So he seems to think that the image itself is good and has theological authority, that it's meant to be kind of like followed, um, that it provides cues to the person who is using the cup. <clears throat> it seems, therefore, that the problem is a failure to acknowledge who is depicted. By allowing repentant adulterers 
Tertullian sees these clergy as substituting out Christ as patron for Shepherd of Hermas as patron. The key action for Tertullian in relation to the images of the Good Shepherd on these chalices, then, is acknowledgement. If Christ is acknowledged as the one imaged, worship will be directed to him. If people approach without the mind of Christ, thinking that it's allowable to you know, bring people who uh, have committed adultery to the chalice, they're acting as though a different patron is receiving worship, which then is idolatry. If the shepherd of Hermas is the one being worshipped, yeah, that's idolatry. That's the worship of an angel. <clears throat> so, um, and another way of, of looking at this also is that if Tertullian's actual concern was with the images, then the entire treatise of On Modesty would be about those images. Like he wouldn't even be, um, he wouldn't even be bothering to talk about the other practices of these clergy if he just straightforwardly thought that they were uh, committing blatant idolatry by having this image on their cups. So in summary, um, the specific action of acknowledgement is the form of honor that Tertullian is emphasizing must be given to the painting in order for honor to pass to the, to the patron as prototype. Failing to acknowledge that Christ is the one imaged, failing to look at the image and acknowledge Christ is the one imaged, misdirects the worship uh, and makes it go towards someone else. And so since acknowledgement is a form of honor, uh, this is veneration of the image on the cup. So lastly, I want to return to St. Methodius of Olympus. And as you'll recall from last time, he has this reference to images of God's angels, which are fashioned of gold. And he also speaks about the practice of honoring images of emperors. And he says that men honor every image in the world and expresses the type prototype principle in this kind of negative way in relation to the question of dishonor. But it's clear that he does think positive honor is being given to images as well. He just expresses the type prototype principle in relation to the action of dishonoring something. Images here made of more precious material seem to be given a higher kind of honor with gold naturally eliciting the highest degree of veneration to an image. The fact that angel images are then described as being made of gold already points to the idea that gestures of honor and respect were done towards these images. You can also draw parallels between the reference to the emperor as king and lord and the depiction, uh, the description of the angels as principalities and powers. This kind of double description and description of authority reinforces the sense that the beings who are imaged would be deserving of honor in a way that relates to the honor of the imperial image. This practice of honoring angels is also corroborated by St. Justin Martyr earlier on. Now, he doesn't explicitly reference images of them, but nonetheless, there is here referenced a liturgical practice of honoring angels. In his first apology, he says, in response to accusations by Romans uh, that Christians are uh, don't believe in any gods at all, don't believe in any divine beings, he says, hence are we called atheists. And we confess that we are atheists so far as gods of this sort are concerned, pagan gods in other words, but not with respect to the most true God, the father of righteousness and temperance and the other virtues, who is free from all impurity, but both him and the son who came forth from him and taught us these things, and the host of the other good angels who follow and are made like to him, and the prophetic spirit. We worship and adore, knowing them in reason and truth, and declaring without grudging to everyone who wishes to learn as we have been taught. And it's interesting to note that this quote includes the type-prototype relationship, that there's this sense that angels are uh, kind of like little images of God. Um, they, are, they follow and are made like to him. It's also possible that we have here in, um, in uh, St. Methodius's comments about the honor given to images an allusion to Jude 1.8, uh, since this also speaks of the danger of slandering, that is verbal acts of dishonor, which seems to be what's in view in uh, St. Methodius's comments about images of the emperor, uh, the danger of slandering angels. Now, in this case, they are evil ones, but they are distinctively referred to as dignitaries. Though the context there is evil angels, the idea of dishonor towards heavenly beings seems to be present. While this is not an explicit reference to the passage in question, in, St. Methodius doesn't seem to be explicitly bringing it up. It does show that the question of how to avoid 
communicating dishonor to a heavenly power is one that early Christians considered. So overall, St. Methodius seems to be talking about the honor passing from the images of the angels to the angels as prototypes. And then, of course, um, by making these images, you also honor and glorify God as well. That's something that St. Methodius notes. Uh, that's something that Orthodox Christians uh, everywhere believe and are comfortable with as well about the images of the saints, that the honor given to the image passes even further upwards to God himself, who's the ultimate prototype, since we're made in his image. This is based on his type prototype principle. Uh, parallels between angels and the emperor and the early Christian concerns for maintaining honor to the angelic hosts. So in summary, the honor given to the image passes to the prototype. The honor given to these images of angels passes to the angels as prototype and then God as ultimate prototype. So to summarize all of this Antonicene written evidence, in St. Ignatius, we have the devotion or honor given to the standard as image passes to the cross of Christ as prototype. In St. Clem Clement, we have the reverent treatment or honor given to the signet as image passes to the spirit, Christ, or the cross as prototype. In origin, we have <clears throat> a honor given to an altar, which passes to the prototype of the heavenly altar or God's throne. In Tertullian, we have the acknowledgement, honor, given to the painting as image, passing to the patron as prototype. In St. Methodius, we have the honor given to the image of the angel, passing to the prototype, namely the angel, and then onwards upwards to God. The implications of this evidence are very significant. The kinds of actions towards images which are stated or implied in these sources are as follows. For St. Ignatius, there is clearly gathering around and exalting the image, and possibly bowing as well. For Clement, there's definitely a ceremonial treatment that is implied by his uh, by the qualities that he ascribes to the signet. This could uh, possibly take the form of concealment or placement, uh, given that those are kind of common ways in which Romans practiced uh, honor towards their signet images. But of course, the possibility of you know bowing towards the images can't be ruled out either, given the connection we saw between uh, signets and bowing. For origin, um, there's clearly adornment being done towards an image. For Tertullian, the action in question is acknowledgement. For St. Methodius, it's honor of an unspecified sort, possibly bowing, possibly kissing of the image of the emperor uh, and images of angels could be some other form of honor as well, such as adornment or lighting candles. These uses of early Christian holy images cannot, therefore, be reduced to merely decorative, didactic, didactic or commemorative use. There is ritual interaction with the image involved, passing to the prototype, and thus we do have a written attestation to image veneration in the pre-Nicene Church. <clears throat>